a very warm welcome to another episode of the Women's Rugby Pod. I'm Johnny Hammond. And I'm Rachel Burford. And we're just going to review the Six Nations from last weekend in the company of Rosie Galligan. Later on, the uh, Red Roses stars come back and come back with a real bang, hasn't she? We've certainly seen that from the last couple of games from her. There's a little bit of news as well. But first of all, and far more importantly, how are you, Rachel Burford? How's Burford Towers and the, the building works? Oh, don't. Let's not go there. I am very good, thank you. It's been a busy week. I did. Um, I went back coaching girls rugby club camp the other day which I haven't been able to do for a while so that was really cool getting back out there with all the girls and just really um yeah just really fun being back with um all the girls remembering that you know how much they love the game and how important it is that we keep you know looking after our community and doing lots there so that was really cool um and yeah I did a full training session last night with them um, with the club so finger all bandaged up and splinted up and oh, yeah Honestly, yeah, that's like nothing. It, it literally, nothing it look, though. it looks like a bit of like um, peeling skin when you've been on holiday and you clearly not looked after your skin in the sun. Yeah, if you are about to sit down and have your lunch and dinner, <laughs> we do apologise for the graphic description of Rachel Burns' dislocated, <laughs> puncturing finger. Um, <laughs> anyway, no, that's that's very good news. Very good news. I suspect for Harlequins, they How are. How was delighted to have you? How was your week? Lovely. Um, had a little espresso trip over to France for a, a dear friend's wedding, and it was uh, just magical. Um, I love France as, as I know you do, and, and, and love the love the language. Love and the it, language. Uh, you're all over the language now. Um, but no, it's just magic in in a monolithic church in in a cave that was two thousand years old, and uh, drinks in a town square, and uh, the venue was just amazing. So yes. I'm so, hence I'm a little croaky, ladies and gentlemen, this morning. Mm. Uh, we flew in late last night. But commitment to the women's rugby pod. Speaking of commitment, Berf, uh, we'll, we'll get to Rosie in just a second. But I think it's only uh, only right to start with the um, committed news from the Italian Rugby Union in the last few days. Have announced a professional contract, 25, I believe, uh, for Italian players. It's just it's just another step in in women's rugby journey, isn't it? Yeah, it really is, and I think it's awesome to see um, Italy take that that leap. And you know, I, I personally know that they, it's not just suddenly a knee jerk reaction to what's going on in the game. They've been working on this for a long time now. It's been a it's been on their radar to create this for their women. And I think since all the changeover, it really gave the the kind of length for an, and the, the detail to then get it across the line. And so, um, yeah, I'm made up for the players. I know that it will mean so much to them. And, and again, it just, it now puts some pressure elsewhere and it shows that that's the only way that the game is going at the moment. I'm not saying it has to look a certain way. It doesn't need to look like the Red Bros way or the Black Ferns way or the way that um, Wales have done it, but the way that you're going to have to start paying your players in order for all the expectations that we have on players nowadays, we, we need to start supporting them properly. And, and yeah, I'm so pleased that Italy have, have taken that leap. If your expectation is here as a, as a, as a union, and that's also driven by fans, isn't it, as well? But if your expectation is here and, and you're, you're playing amateurs against professionals, it, it just doesn't work. And you can't, we can't keep expecting. You remember we had Chelsea Alley? Didn't we? I don't know, 12, 18, 24 months ago on the, on, on the pod and describing her five jobs and, and just the way that she just can't look after her body properly. She's got to pack up meals and all the rest of that kind of stuff. It just It's just not fair on the product that's being produced. Um, and we've said this for a very, very long time and it's brilliant for, for, for Italy. Alongside that, there's a new broadcasting agreement uh, with Eleven Sport to broadcast a weekly match and final stage of the the Italian Serie A league. Um, so again, that exposure is coming out as well. And I, 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 I'm not, obviously it has taken a while to to get together because it's reasonably comprehensive, isn't it? Um, this this deal allowing players to train between eighty and one hundred and thirty days, and obviously will help them massively with the World Cup. So brilliant. The mind just does move towards pressures on other countries. Then. Yeah. The likes, you know, the likes here in the home union in Scotland, they have 
arrangements, don't they, with their with their players? But it, but it's nothing like a, a professional contract. Um, and of course, Ireland, who in the last review early in the year, talking about building the game from from the roots up, but it almost seems like that's just way behind the eight ball. Yeah, I think it certainly is going to put pressure on because it all it does is create attention around the fact that Italy have contracts. You you can people where they will consider Italy. <clears throat> you know, having not been as successful in the Six Nations as some of the other nations who aren't professional or have some form of professional contracts in place, that's naturally going to increase um, pressure. It's going to externally, people are going to start talking, well, what are you going to do now, Scotland? What are you going to do now, Ireland? We're all waiting. Um, and, and that pressure, I think, in the past would go away quite quickly. But there's a lot of people that are sticking their heels in nowadays and not say and not going. Do you know, oh, okay, fine, we'll go another year without any support or or adequate support, and and that's just not not the case anymore. There's a lot of people out there that feel really strongly about this, whether it's rightly or wrongly or done in the right way. They stick their heels in and they keep talking about it, and um, so you know that pressure won't go away. No, no. I- Absolutely, the, the 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 chatter is there, isn't it? And um, it's obviously been been at that chatter for for a long time. And it, it's great that these things are that are moving on. And um, yeah, it can, can only be a good thing. And whether it's through pressure or whatever it is, you know, I I think Scotland and Ireland have have to follow suit. Um, it's just just not acceptable anymore. Um, they would consider themselves larger unions than, than Italy. And if Italy can progress and, and understand the nature of the, the way that rugby is now, I, I think Scotland and Ireland, it, it's almost embarrassing, isn't it? Um, the fact that they aren't there. So, no fingers crossed, but um, I was going to say bravo to Italy. I don't know what well done in Italian is. Mm. Hold on, let me try ask Alexa. You could do that. I mean, I know you'd know straight away what it'd be in French. Uh, we all know that. Now you're bilingual, trilingual. Uh, yeah, you're on mute. Well done. Um, Italy. So that's Italy done and dusted. Well done, them. We'll come to their game uh, in, in just a second. But England, um, let's go through the results from, from, from round three of the uh, Women's Six Nations. England 58, Wales 5 at a packed out Kings home. Over 14,500. Record for a Red Roses game. It was uh, held back in 2010 at your home ground at the Stoop, the uh, the Women's World Cup final. Ireland 29, Italy 8 uh, at Musgrave Park. Uh, Scotland went down to France 8.28 at Scotston. So no games this weekend. Round 4 continues on Friday the 22nd of April. Wales against France at the Cardiff Arms Park. A little night game there. They're like a little night game, don't they, in the, in the capital. Uh, Saturday 23rd in Parma, 20 past 7, Italy hosts Scotland. And on Sunday 24th, England take on Ireland. Ireland at 12 noon at Leicester Welford Road. Without further ado, let's get a lady who's been at the centre of those three games so far for the Red Roses. One of your teammates at Harlequins. Here's Rosie Gallagher. <laughs> I'm Sarah Hedonate, and you're listening to the Women's Rugby Pod. It's a very warm welcome to Rosie Gallagher, Harlequins and Red Roses, second row. Just where are you at the moment? Obviously, just finished round three, um, starting against Scotland, against Italy, came off the bench, uh, obviously, against Wales. Where are the emotions right now? You must be at, I'm just delighted to be back in the England shirt. Yeah, I think I'm actually a bit emotionally drained at the minute. Um, there's been so many highs. And then the training has been another level. Um, so I'm just happy to be spending an Easter with my family, uh, having four days off for the first time in a long, long time. Um, but yeah, like, absolutely over the moon to be back in the setup. Um, it's been an incredible journey so far, and we've still got a few weeks to go. So fingers crossed, stay in the mix and um, get to that Grand Slam title, hopefully. Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> um, how. Where was your last involvement? In it? How how long ago was it? Uh, so previous to this campaign, it was 2019, uh, six Jeez. nations, which was February. Um, so yeah, I think it worked out over a thousand days 
um, between the first and the second. But I've just been saying to everyone really that the second has been a lot sweeter just because of the setbacks that I did have. Um, so obviously getting your first cap is a phenomenal, phenomenal feeling. But this second cap for me has just been a completely different feeling and a completely different experience. Yeah, I mean, I heard some 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 long time between first and second caps, second and third caps, but that is uh, that is is right up there. Look, we'll, we'll talk about the game and, and the game so far in the Six Nations. But you mentioned there the, the journey. I just need to to know. You go back into that camp. Was it like putting a, a an old pair of slippers back on, or you know, that, that, that's three years? We we slightly slightly tentative about it. Um, a bit I of think, both. Yeah, I think so. I think I was nervous, but I also felt that. Um, my club performance had, well, I just started loving rugby again, I think. And I felt like I was actually performing on the pitch. So I think in 2019, if you'd have asked me about going into camp, I would have been really grateful for the opportunity. Whereas this time round, I feel like I've put the work in um, to get back to where I am and to be able to like put my hand up for the opportunity to play for England again. Yeah, well, hundred percent, you have. And is that, that that change of club was that was that important in a sort of reinvigoration of of where you are? Perhaps you, I don't, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but perhaps you wanted to sort of park that eighteen months, two years, and we'll just touch on that in, in a second, if if we may. Um, but just park that up, go to a new club, start afresh. Right here we go. Goal is is England and World Cup and all the rest of it. Yeah, definitely. I think I just stopped loving rugby. I found it really, really hard to get back into it. Both mentally and physically um it, it is just one of those things and I think I just knew for myself I needed a bit of a change I needed to be able to like reinvent myself um and be able to put like the the rosy that I wanted to be on the pitch I just didn't feel like I could get that at Saracens at that at that moment in time so um after having a chat with Gerard and telling him about my goals and objectives and how um like how much he wanted to get behind me and support that that um, I thought moving to Quinns at the time was the best option for me, and I, I think that really is the reason why um, I've been pulled back into the into the setup. Yeah, Bertha obviously you know, can't join us for this chat, but yeah, she says yeah that personal element with Gerard is 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 is, is huge with him. He's he's very good at backing the the, the person as as well as the player. Um, utterly the way it should be, shouldn't it? Really, just did you ever think in your in your darkest moments we're talking about? I really, really sick with uh, with with uh, meningitis, wasn't it? Um, did you ever think, well, yeah, that's it? I can just, I, I just need to sort of put the boots away, and, and uh, yeah, I'm never going to get them out. I didn't think that um, with my with meningitis, with meningitis, it's injuries as well. Yeah, with meningitis, I knew that it was something that I was just going to have to really take every day as it came. It was more so with my ankle, with the frustrations. With one day you'd feel like you made 10 steps forward and the next day three steps back and um, for me the injury post meningitis was the hardest bit I felt like I was in a big hole where I just started getting back onto the pitch trying to convince everybody that I was fully fit ready to go um, and then I just remember being on the floor on gas and air being like okay Rosie this is now your time to actually just fully put the boots down fully get fit fully get healthy um, and like they all say hopefully have a strong comeback and um I don't think I had that strong comeback straight away. It definitely took a lot of like mental resilience to try and get back to the happy chappy that I was on the pitch prior to it. Um, but yeah, it's all a journey and like I, I'm grateful for it. It's taught me a lot of lessons. Yeah, I remember you come back and, and doing the ankle and announcing it. I think it was on the pod here, just being absolutely gutted for you. Anyway, look, let's 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 start looking back quite too much because I think you know, everybody uh, that knows you. Um, but delighted to see you back achieving it and, and, and playing the kind of rugby that we they know you can. But for me, and I know I'm speaking with, with Berth about it, just think you, your game's gone to a, to another level uh, in this Six Nations. Um, stop blushing. Uh, <laughs> and, and tell us, I mean, do you feel that? Um, do you feel your, your game has gone on? And where do you think you, you, you've built your, your game up? I think I've actually surprised myself, in all honesty. Um, the first week of camp, I just said, you know what, I'm going to put my hands up. I'm going to train as hard as I can. Um, and if I get an opportunity, then happy days. But actually, now that I'm a couple of weeks in and I'm looking at getting like a fifth cap now, like I wouldn't have expected that at the start. So I've just really started enjoying rugby again. I've spent a lot of time with the SNC at Harlequins, just really 
hammering down on my fitness. That's always been something that I've had to work on. Um, and then just getting strong, um, learning from people, learning from the likes of Abby Ward, like that's been great. Got the likes of Zoe Allcroft coming back and set up as well. And she's been really supportive with anything that I've needed. So just like actually being confident enough to ask people for help, ask people for support and put myself first to make myself a priority. Yeah. No, it's, uh, it takes a lot of strength to to ask for help and, and we'll just generally ask questions, I, I suspect, in that kind of pressured uh, elite environment. Let's go back to, to last weekend then. How phenomenal, because I, I guess you're in this perfect situation. You did all the warm-up in front of the crowd, 14,500, record crowd ever, you're part of history, um, and you got to sit on the bench and kind of absorb it all in before you then sort of entered the field and, and, and played your part. How, how awesome was it in the build-up, the walk-up to the, to the pitch, all the rest of it? It was incredible. It was honestly incredible. Like coming out, I think because we played the um, Prem final there, yeah. and I was kind of expecting a crowd like that. I didn't realise the difference in numbers compared to the Prem final. So when I came out and I saw that pretty much every seat was full, well, full at the time in the yeah. warm up, I was like, oh my lord, we're in for a good day. Um, and then the rugby in the first half was very, very, could have gone either way at some points. So it was, it was interesting hearing how many Welsh fans there actually were and Welsh national anthems and Welsh songs and then the English coming back and I just think it was an incredible day incredible family den an incredible spectacle for like women's rugby um and where like the crowds and um, go where did I mean do, do you guys post-match just just have a little chat about like well I mean look one of the most unique things about the, the Red Roses is, is your connection with your fans it, it's it's never ceased ceased to amaze me, and it's it always been been the way the last you know, two decades and, and way beyond. But um, did you have a chat in the, in the change room? Like, wow, you know, okay, we, we've got another win, but wow, what an incredible day! Are you able to at that point? I think it was it was more so in the huddle on the pitch. Okay, um, just said like, great day. Obviously, we came away with the win. We did exactly what we wanted to do, um, but now we then kind of turned our attention to. Let's go and make sure that we can inspire the next generation and go and talk to all of our fans and supporters and families. Like everyone was there to support us and we want to show them um, that we're grateful for their, for their support and that they're part of our journey too. Yeah. We've got to talk about Abby and just everyone at the WRP, just dreadfully sad to, to hear of her. Her dislocated broken ankle. Um, she's clearly in, in some distress and not easy for, for anyone. I thought the, the broadcast did brilliantly well to, to stay away from showing replays and stuff because you just don't want to do that. Um, was there was there chat of, right, well, you know, a little bit of this needs to be for Abby because, you know, uh, unless she's Superwoman, the you know, World Cup is probably not going to be, be hers this time round. Yeah, I think so. I think I wasn't on the pitch at the time, but I know right. for sure that um, it is difficult when people get injured. I know yeah. that the girls were affected when I was injured. Um, I was at the Bristol game when George Evans got injured and yep. a lot of respect to be able to play on like she did um, in that aspect. So I think all of the girls really came together and part of their chat probably was to say, let's do this for Abby. I know after the game, Abby Ward spoke about um, sending her a lot of love um, in the press. So definitely that was probably spoken about and us girls on the bench just wanted to wish her well and, and be there for her in whatever way that we can over the next few months. Yeah, absolutely. On to the positive stuff. Positive slash work-ons. Um, was there any element of a, of the English like frustrated last weekend? I thought Wales's passion and physicality, we know they're going to come with passion, we know they're going to come with physicality, but I just thought they, they frustrated England at times. and It, it was a... Uh, a sticky performance. Yeah, Wales did a really good job at getting in our heads at some points um, and speaking to a few of the girls afterwards. That definitely was part of their game plan um, and getting to the heads of the players that they knew could potentially erupt. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, yeah, I think they did a really good... They did a really good... Um, well, they took away the line speed in our line out. They put in some fantastic hits just to show... leave their mark. Um, and we've... We've had a look at it this week and we've kind of looked at how we're going to get past those things because there's definitely going to be times in like the France game, for example, where things like that will occur again. So it's about how we can come together, regroup um, and put our best foot forward rather than letting it letting it get to us a little bit 
um, in the first half. But I think second half performance, we were a lot happier with. We really showed them what our fitness levels were and we took it to the line and we really believed them. And yeah, we've, there's there's a lot of work on, like you said, but we took away a lot of positives as well. Yeah, 100%. So what, what was the, the general theme then since... Oh, look, yeah. You've won by fifty-three clear points, you know, and so so all of this is measured, of course. Um, you know what we're talking about, but but I know, you know, I know, I know Midswell and 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 the, many of the leadership group and, and you guys, and you you, you expect probably a, a little bit more. So what what was the top of the list? Well, I don't know when you go back together Monday, whatever. What was on top of top of the whiteboard that uh, the mid was generally talking about? Um, I think for us, it was just making sure that we stayed on top um in both the mental and physical battle so making sure that we were the ones to get over the game line before they did making sure that we were the ones to put them back uh, when they were carrying um whereas it's all about our physicality and our and our speed um and that's something that we've been working on a lot this week it's been a very tough week of training <laughs> <laughs> okay, ladies and if you're just listening, uh, the face said it all there. So, um, yes, it has been. I, I can assure you. I'm smiling through the pain, I promise. <laughs> but the, 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 the benefits may well be worth it. And we, we, we move on to Ireland. Um, what are you expecting from, from them? Have we been spoken about this week yet, or, or do we tuck in come, uh, come post Easter Eggs Tuesday? Yeah, we haven't spoken about them yet. This week was all about us. Okay. Um, I think the clips will go out this weekend for people to have a look at, but next week we'll be focusing on Ireland um, with also a broader look into the future for the France game as well. I think the next the next game is really going to put us in good stead going into the France game. So uh, Ireland have played some really good rugby, but also um, there's areas of inexperience that we're going to probably look to exploit. Um, so yeah, I think I put up a good fight and hopefully we can we can make this our week we can put everything together the little bits and bobs that need to come together to make it a really good game for us yeah i mean and a very strong second second row pairing uh nick of friday uh monaghan in there who's been, been on fire hasn't she um do you relish a kind of challenge like that yeah i think so i think obviously playing against people in the prem um it's a bit different to then going to an international stage um like working with abby with poppy with whoever's in the row um, it's trying to find that pairing and how we can make the best out of working together rather than against each other. And I think that's going to be the same uh, playing against Ireland. Like, I know what her strengths are, what her weaknesses are by watching her in the Prem. But actually, in an Ireland shirt, is she going to be a completely different player? I don't know. Oh, it's exciting stuff, isn't it? Um, uh, only a couple more. I'm conscious of day off and you're you joining us and much appreciated in this. Sunshine to be enjoyed it and, and Easter eggs to, to be eaten. Um okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. You know. Yeah. I forgot. You struggled with your fitness. Um. Leave. I'll. I'll eat yours for you. No problem. You're welcome. Um. Going on to, I mean, Sam Milton, you, your coach, quite open at the beginning of the tournament. Used the first three games to to give some rotation to have a look at some players and what have you. Um. Is there was there that sense this week that this this little sort of mini block now of of Ireland France is is where combinations are going to start to to grow and pretty much sort of getting the rhythm of a, of a, of a starting 15, starting 23, looking ahead to, to that World Cup. Is it, is, is, is it ramped up this week? Yeah, I think so. I think the training's gone up another level, which I didn't think could happen. <laughs> um, but it's definitely gone up another level. I think everybody's kind of knows that this is the last two games is the last, op last competitive opportunity to put your front foot forward. Um, but I don't think, I think the season's still, there's still a lot to play for in the season, in the yeah. Prem. Um, and it's kind of like just staying in the moment, staying in the Six Nations and then keep building post that um, in the Prem and then hopefully um, have a good good training block before going into the World Cup stuff. So although it is um, a, a time for everyone to try and get involved and everybody wants to be playing in that France game at the end, um, it's not the be-all end-all. I think there's still a lot of time to take your opportunity and get involved in the World Cup squad. So uh, we, we, when you when you play against France on uh, quarter past two on the 30th, um, who's going to be My in the birthday, second? By the way. Is it? Oh, well, there you go. That, oh, that would be some birthday present. So I'm I'll just, I'll just waving my magic rubby wand here. Um, who's going to be starting in the second row with you? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I would love to be starting in the second row. Um, 
there's a lot of very very good players on that pitch um but i think i've worked i've really enjoyed working with abby and um, she has a lot of experience on her side very calm calm head um so i'd like to say if i was to be starting i'd like to say that i'd be working with abby um yeah <laughs> there you go abby ward rosie gallagher it's not a bad second row pairing is it uh ladies and gentlemen uh be fantastic um look all the very very best uh i really really appreciate your time um and yeah it's been, just been great um as you said the, the setbacks you've had um and to see you to see you back on the park and performing for for harlequins and and yeah, in the last few weeks for for England and the Red Roses has has been brilliant. Yes, it warms the heart. So, um, well done you. Thank you very much. Uh, and all the best for Ireland uh, and France and selection. Um, and you take care of yourself. Cheers, Rosie. Lovely. Thank you very much. I'm Donna Kennedy, and you're listening to the Women's Rugby Pod. She speaks incredibly well, doesn't she? For a lady in her early twenties birth you'd obviously be getting to get to know her her pretty well what did she bring in the change room on the field for for you a, a club and and watching her for for the red roses um i think early on she's somebody who's not afraid to speak up and speak out and take on leadership roles um and she's not afraid to be wrong or to ask silly questions which i think then helps her and others around her considerably. Um, and I think on the pitch, what I think I've seen her transform over the last few months, and I think this is part of the reason why she's got into the England squad, is just her work rate. She seems to be doing things that, you know, on our kick chases, she's the first person there when our wingers should be the first people there. You know, she's doing those kind of things that are unexpected, um, which make others follow. And I think she's really kind of stepped up this season. She, when she came into the squad um, back in the summer, she she had this idea that she wanted to push for a Red Rose spot. She thought that she could get an opportunity if there was some injuries. Um, and she's absolutely grasped all of it. You know, even though... There were some injuries. There were also some injuries that, you know, didn't keep players out, but she nudged them out because the way that she was playing and the way that she was training. So, you know, it's just proven product of getting head down and working really hard creates an opportunity. Uh, and now she's she's trying to keep hold of that opportunity. Just hugely, hugely impressed um, with her in the, in, the, in the white shirt in the Six Nations. Big athlete, we know that, you know, she's... She, Big strong lady, and she's always been such. But just, just the handling and the the, the intelligence, the understanding of the game, um, cutting those corners to be at the right place at the right time. Um, I, that that's what's been really impressive for me. Her ability to to, to carry. I was very impressed with her in that opening game against against Scotland. Um, and also, we mustn't forget, it, she came back for what is something like eighteen months out of the game. She came out from a huge amount of time yeah. out, out of the game. Um, and, and now she's you know, properly vying and in, in one of the top spots to, to get a World Cup spot. I, mean, I know we asked her, her about it there. Um, she gave her answer. But what an incredible journey. And as you say, if you want something bad enough and you work hard enough for it, it can be achieved. Good lesson for the children. <laughs> They're all listening. They indeed they are. <laughs> Overall, then I know we spoke to to, to Rosie there and you know, about the performance in, uh, in England. Um, what do you think overall? Um. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I I I think they'll probably some areas they'll be quite disappointed again, which has been kind of the theme. And part of me wants to say the chop and change is what's going to be part of that. But then at the same time, there's like real simple things that they're not doing so well in the open play. I think their exits are excellent. Their set piece has come on by miles. Um, you know, the example of, you know, the difference between England and Wales is massively. They receive the kickoff, kick, put pressure on, turn it over or force a penalty, kick to the corner, and then suddenly England score. It's... Uh, Wales could not do that. They couldn't exit. Their attacking structure couldn't break down England. And, and for me, you know, 
I want to see this England team really light up. The talent that they have is unbelievable. It it genuinely is. But we I don't just don't feel like we're seeing we're seeing it enough. We saw Emmy Scarrett one line break. Yeah. You know, and and I think that has a bit to do with you know Amber Reed coming on, just staying really square, moving, letting the ball do the work. I think we've got these fantastic players that want to do the work themselves because they're so talented, footwork fend, they've got the pace, they've got a step. But sometimes the ball can just do the work itself. And yeah, I mean, it's a comprehensive win, isn't it? Again, um, however, I just think, I think they've got more. I think they've got so much more that we're not seeing yet. I, I was frustrated. I, I came around disappointed. It's 58-5. Um, you know, I know, be, yeah, in, yeah. In beating yeah. Wales. For, for any Englishman, I mean, if that was the other way around, that the Welsh would be utterly delighted. I mean, I, I've got a, a foot in each camp, so I'm not too bad. But... Um, yeah, I, I was kind of frustrated. A couple of line outs went as a begging. That was minimum 10 points. So that's 68. Um, and a team who, who we, we mentioned it two weeks ago, Wales can't exit. Don't The, the length of kick it just it isn't good enough. And I know Robin Wilkin came came in there attempt to, to try and fix that. But she's the only one. You know, Hannah Jones, uh, Karen Lake, don't, don't particularly have particularly strong kicking games that I've ever seen. And therefore, all that responsibility is is on is on the half backs um, to kick the ball, and they just they just don't get even when they get a penalty there in twenty two. They're yes. barely outside the twenty two five meters outside the twenty two for England to to, you know, to try and put pressure on again. Yeah, I don't understand why they're not giving Clakey George a opportunity. He hits fifty twenty twos for fun at Gloucester Hartbury. Like, I don't know. I agree. I thought when she came in the squad, I thought, you know what, like, try her. That, that's not? the one thing. Like, if you actually looked at Wales, like, their set piece was pretty good. Yep. Um, like, their driving point. line out, that which has been really successful for them in other games. Um, but the, the difference in other games is that maybe you can get away with it being a little bit further out. If you're, if you're not getting that into the into the 22 or five metres off the try line, then England are going to be able to defend it and, and break it down, whereas maybe some other teams can't, and that's why they got their success there. But, you know, just pin pin teams. And that's what Clakey Jaws can do. And you've and you, you got that because it's a very settled side. You know, if, you, if you start Kira Bevan at nine, a huge experienced player, great communicator, Kerry Lake, Hound Jones outside in, in the centres. You know, there's plenty of experience in, in around... Clicky, I believe. Clicky, yeah, and but the, but also like, it may not have the experience of playing internationally, but she's a starting player at one of the top clubs in in the Allens Premier Fifteens, which arguably is pressure every single week yeah. that she deals with and gets her team out of a hole a number of times. So, you know. <sighs> Like England have, they've used the Allianz Premier 15 as a performance indicator for players. Rightly so. Like, and uh, we haven't quite seen that directly there with a 10 that's delivered multiple times. And she's not just a kicker. She can pass the ball really well. She's got a bit of a step on her. She's she's a bit of a size, so she can carry as well. So it, she kind of has different elements. And, you know, uh, yeah, I just, it would be, I think it's a shame that they didn't give her a shot, especially when they do him so much rotation this weekend. Yeah. You know, if they, if they see as El Snow Seal as their starting 10 and she's the number one, fine, but why not put Clayker George on the bench, give her a shot to come on for 15 minutes in a game they knew they probably weren't going to win, but they could, they wanted to test England and they did. They've made England make a lot of errors in that first 20. And I think if they didn't have that big break in play, then they may have been able to keep hold of that kind of momentum and that frustration within England. Um, but yeah, I, I would, I can't see them doing that now though, for, <clears throat> excuse me, for, they got France this weekend and then they've got Italy, is it? France, obviously on, on that Friday night game and then round front, obviously the, uh, yeah, Italy at home on April the 30th. Um, yeah, I, I agree. And I think you've got to give her a chance, bring her to the squad ahead of a World Cup. As you say, performing club level, give, give her a chance in an international shirt because you're not you know, you're not going to find out for a World Cup, are you? And and then possibly, you know, Robin Wilkins could, could play fullback. Kayleigh Powell, I know, is a devastating runner. Put, possibly put her on a wing. Um, and then you've got a couple of 
10 type options and you've got a couple of kicking options and that really for me is is, is the biggest piece of the of the jigsaw for, for Wales to sort out yeah and I think you could see that England's game plan they knew that you yes. know they can't exit like or well, if they do they don't go very far and we back out our back our line out you know so in England's mindset it'll be like right let's pin them either get a get the ball back from a penalty or a turnover because they're always going to run it back. Caleb Plough is one of the only players in the whole Six Nations ha has the stats for running back, not kicking back. Um, and so then they then they, suddenly they've got a set piece, either in their half or just on, sorry, in Wales half or on the halfway line. So it's happy days for them. And and you could see that's what they were doing. You can see it just set up to do that. And yeah, it's just disappointing that they didn't use that opportunity or even, even Flo Williams, who has had a bit of experience as well. Caveat to that, and they, if you did know, knew nothing about Wales and had never seen, and you saw a game from twelve months ago, the last Six Nations and this Six Nations, and it just looks. I mean, it's pretty much the same players, but it looks like a completely, completely different side. Yeah, I think naturally, like they're fitter, so they've got. Um more in their tank in the engine but just more organized they know their roles better they understand that they've got great clarity around that and you know i think a lot of that is is definitely from wales but it's also from playing at the level of the Allianz premier 15 yep. as well so yeah i think their set piece like i said i think it, it it was it was really strong at times against england and at other times it wasn't so um yeah they definitely look like a different side the result probably doesn't reflect that. And people looking, oh, well, obviously it's the same. But let's remember, England have kicked on so much as well. So it's not the same England playing against Wales with when Wales have kicked on. Like, England have kicked on tenfold since last Six Nations. Yeah. So with that in mind, they, they were worlds apart. They were hugely competitive, you know, at times... I think in the first half, they didn't even get into England's half. They were just pinned the whole time, but they absorbed a lot of pressure. And so, you know, I think there are obviously clearly so much more to go, but what I don't want in, uh, Wales to do is get in this trap of we're on a journey. We're on a journey the whole time, because then at what point does it become not a journey? And at what point does it go, right, we are ready now. This is about our performance. We have the ability, we have the players, we have the contracts um, to really make something of results. Um, because I think for I've seen that happen in teams where they go, oh, we're, we're just developing players or this is a development phase and, and it stays with you and then suddenly it becomes the excuse. So I'd like to think that, you know, and this is a bit another disappointment of why there wasn't a bit more of a rotation with some new players like an Emma Swords as well. Like, why not give these, some of these players an opportunity before your warm up games where you need to kind of know your team leading into the World Cup? Why not have a bit of an experiment of some of these players to then see and then and then come into Six Nations? Right, we know who our probably our 30 are going to be. We've got a few players on the cast. Right now we go. Yeah, I, I just wonder whether Jan Cunningham thought, you know, we've opened up with two, oh, we could. Probably not going to be England, but you know, let's. It's going to be a great occasion, and we'll put our best foot forward, and let's keep it similar, and see what pressure we can put on England. I, 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 I get that temptation. I think possibly yeah. you know, uh, against France, they'll like to think that Italy game is is, is very winnable. Um, you yeah, know that that France game possibly that the, there is a little bit more rotation there. Speaking of, of rotation. Um, Simon, it's a question I've asked him a long time. You know, where's that divide between having a look at players and actually going right, getting some combinations going, which I know you're you're very very keen on, and you know one of the best combinations um, in women's rugby of all time. You uh, you and, and and Skaz in that midfield. What's going to be the England team then for you um, for this 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 next round of, round of games for for England against Ireland? <laughs> We've got time. Vicky Cornborough. Yeah, Vic Cornborough. I think Amy Cocaine's fit, but I think they'll probably start with Lark Davis. Yeah, you can't possibly not chuck Amy Cocaine straight in, but... Yeah, Sarah um, Burn. Yeah. Um, Abby Ward. Oh, God, now you know it's going to get tricky. <clears throat> um, oh, 
God, because Alex played so well. Yes, she would have been my player of the match. I mean, if you want to get that same back row in, then... See, the thing is, though, I don't think we saw Poppy at all. No, I, I, I'm with you. And you need, a, you need her out in the loose more, especially when you come to France. Um, oh... Tough, isn't it? I, I, I agree. Yeah, you know, and we spoke to her last week. She said, you know, I, I, I get that. I, I feel I get the best out of me at, at eight. Um, yeah, 100%. Her at six, Pack at seven, Hunter at eight. Therefore, Gallagher's got to go second row. Alex then you Matthews haven't got Alex in. Alex Matthews off the bench. So you're starting Zoe. She's not fit, is she? She should be. That's on the bench. Can't come straight back in like Eric again. Mm, so well player of the year. I think you get a bit extra credit. The thing is, they train so hard that you play it and you train at a match intensity. And I, I will only ever work with one physio who said to me once, she said, oh yeah, I'm not rehabbing you back for 20 minutes at the end of the game. I'm re rehabbing you back for 80 minutes. So you're ready. If you need to play 80, you're ready to play 80. So, okay. uh, and that physio is, the England physio now. So hopefully that, <laughs> that, that kind of mindset is there. Okay. Go on then, nine. Uh, Leanne. Tough. Yeah, I, I think Leanne will come in. Um, yeah. I, I have to say, I'm huge impressed with, uh, with Mo Hunt. She obviously asked her to go and do a job to, to keep tempo high and, and she very much stuck yeah, up to that in these games. Um, she's been fabulous. Um, yeah, I think she comes off the bench. Um, go on then, you're 10. Zoe Harrison. Yep. 12. I'd go Amber, but I think he'll go Helena. Agreed. I think he'll go Helena. Scout. Mm, not sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it's Scouts at 13. And I think he'll go Lydia and Jess. Yeah. I'm so gutted for Abby Dow. Um, oh. You know, I think when you talk about all unsure of combinations, whether she's wing or fullback, she would have been starting if it was World Cup final, for sure. She's that Great. devastating as a player. Um, Ellie killed down at 15. I don't know if he'll give McKenna a shot at 15. She'd be huge impressive. Huge impressive. And again... And bolts. Brilliant. It, very, very yeah. tightly screwed on. I think, I don't know, does he look at Ellie Kildan to come on a bit like a Mo and lift that intensity and lift that tempo again? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, jeez, what headaches. What lovely headaches. Yeah. Really nice headaches. Anyway, we, we should move on. Yeah, we, we should. We should move on to um, the, the, the France-Scotland game. Uh, or should I say Scotland-France against Scotland. Uh, it was 3.28 at half time. So much, much better second half performance from Scotland. Um, Sansu's with a couple of tries. Elme, Trumoulier, uh, and Chloe Rowley. Oh, Rowley. Rowley, not Rowley. Um, <clears throat> for Scotland. Ugh, it's nearly there for Scotland, isn't it? Um, and I think they'll be annoyed with their first 40, but put a few things right in that second. Yeah, definitely did. Like, you know, just how competitive they became in that second half, which is, it's just annoying, isn't it? When you see a team be able to come together in the second half, as opposed to starting that way. Um, France obviously started really well, but a bit of individual brilliance from Sansus and um, put them on the board nice and early. Um, but yeah, I think when Scotland get their tails up a little bit, they're really hard to, to stop. And it's, it's their own errors that let them down. It's kind of like those last passes or the last catch of a pass. And you know, that's where, that's that next level for them. Um, but they will be pleased with that scoreline. Uh, I, I know they've lost and they, I know that they'll probably be thinking, oh, we left so, too much out there. But to only lose 28 points to eight, also England will be looking at that thinking, well, we put more than double than that on them. Yeah. And uh, and albeit, yeah, it was first game, Scotland's first outing. They all teams get better as they progress through. But um, but yeah, I think I think they'd be happy with a lot of things in that game. Yeah, I, I yeah, the, the Sansu's individual brilliance. Let's all applaud that. Um, 
but overall possession, Scotland 62%. Overall territory, Scotland 52%. I mean, these are all nice stats for France. But it, uh, again, for a third go, game in a row, they are getting time in opposition 22. 4 minutes 21. Time in, in France is 22. France had 1 minute 54 seconds. And yet the score's 28-8. And it's that final bit, isn't it? It's that final bit that Scotland, they're making the line breaks. They're, they're getting themselves in the right place. They just can't finish off. How do you fix that? Time together. Yeah. Um, you know, playing and training at high intensity when you're fatigued and under pressure. Uh, I mean, it, it, they're quite simple things. I think if you get in the first bit, which is breaking down the defence to get in behind them, then that's often... Rolo agrees. That's often, um, you know, the hardest part to it. And then it's kind of just finishing it off. Um, but, yeah, it's hard. It's challenging, isn't it? Like, how do you, as a group of players who have minimal amount of time together, you know, be able to fix, you know, which maybe their mind errors, you know, their focus errors. Yeah, and I, I, th I thought the time together with the, you know, with the chopping and changing the World Cup qualifiers and all the rest of that time with Dubai, I, I thought it would be would serve them really well coming to the Six Nations, um, but possibly, you know, with um, you know, losing such a, a dear teammate, you know, it's been an exhausting emotionally, mental roller coaster, and I just wonder whether, yeah, they're just a little bit, little bit tired, and yeah, that's that's no fault of their own. Um, just a little bit tired mentally, um, and that's possibly coming in. But uh, look, they you know, they will be back up. They're incredibly, incredibly proud bunch, led quite superbly um, by Dr. Rachel Malcolm. Um, and they will go over it to Italy with real confidence, I think, um, and look to, to, to take an Italian scalp. Whether those contracts kick in uh, and the news of those, and the, yeah, there's a real bounce in the step of, of Italy. Um, who knows? Time will tell. Move on to Italy then. Um, at Musgrave Park, 29-8. Ireland bounce back, 10-3 at half time. Mulhall, Neve Jones, Higgins, uh, a penalty giant, O'Dwyer as well with the uh, with the touchdowns. Bertoni for Italy. What did you make of, of Ireland? Good, good bounce back ability. Yeah, I thought it, it was a good performance by them. And we spoke last week about how actually they could retain the ball really well and they could be quite devastating at times. And I think they did that. They took their opportunities against Italy. Italy, in my opinion, I've, they played pretty poorly. Yeah. Um, they really never got into the game. It's a little bit like that England game. They never really took an opportunity. or, or it, was, it was bizarre. It was a little bit like... Felt like, oh, we'll get one. Oh, we'll, we'll, we'll get one on the... Something will happen. Yeah. Waiting as, for somebody else to, to do something to spark yeah, the game. As opposed to, like, actually creating it, being this, you know, incredibly dangerous attacking, offloading, um, you know, different type of kicking team that they can be. We didn't see any of that. And, and I think... You know that was a real shame because they didn't take any, they didn't shoot any fires. Shot shots fired. <laughs> How's the wedding for you? Yeah, still, uh, yeah. still having a drink or two. You know, from, from some incredibly hopeful shoots in, in that France game, it may have been 39-6 uh, against France in, in, in round one. But, yeah, there, there was there was a lot there. You thought, do you know what, that's a really, really good first step for them. Tough, you know, probably the toughest opening to the Six Nations away in France. But actually, they, that's a stepping stone. And, you know, they, they can move on from that. But we just haven't, as you say, just haven't seen them fire any shots. I don't know kind of what's, what's going on in the background and whether, you know, the contracts, whether we're just sort of milling about and whether that was sort of had any effect. But, um, yeah, it, it, it was a shame to see that again. And I think um, Stacey Flood in the second half, the way that she kicked, she completely kicked it. Again, we talk, talked about this being an England weapon, which it's a shame that I don't think Stacey Flood will be available for the England game. But that could have been, that's a big difference territorially where you can play. And she was brilliant. She had 50-22, um, a couple of kicks over to the corner, um, you know, just relieving pressure, not giving it it. And then all of a sudden, oh, we're back here again. And 
And that's the difference of being able to like, just turn a team constantly. And I think, you know, actually Italy had a lot of possession and, you know, they had more passes than the opposition. They had more possession than the opposition, but their defence was next level. Like their defence was brilliant. It was double tackles, back on your feet, double tackles. I mean, they went down to 13, 14 players at one point and still managed to, to hold Italy out. And maybe that's been a bit of a, a mindset shift for them in this coming week. It was more about how they're going to defend against them. Yeah, no, no I, I wouldn't disagree. And I was, I was impressed with impressed with Ireland. Um, yes, and hopefully we have a, an Irish guest on next week. If not the uh, the top man himself, uh, Mr. Greg McWilliams. Um, well done, Ireland. Uh, good victory for them over over Italy. Um, and yeah, they, they will go in to that game against England. Yeah, probably that's some of those seven stars, which is going to change that back line hugely. But um, yeah, we, we're seeing now you know, what what Ireland can do, and yeah, they can they can throw a chance of the wind, can't they? Because not involved in this in you know, in the World Cup. And actually, therefore, they've got you know, another four, four and a half years to, to build for the next one. So, um, yeah, the impressive stuff from, from then after after that um, disappointing last uh, round against France. I'm Sarah Franco, and you're listening to the Woman Rugby Call. Let's get up to date with the... Only not a huge amount of news. All the focus on the on the uh, on the Six Nations, but just a little bit of news from around the world. Brilliant! The Under 18s festival has been going on um, up at uh, up in Scotland. Uh, here are the results then: uh, Wales 24 over Scotland, England beat Ireland 17-12, Wales beat Italy 14-0, France 26-0 over Ireland, 0-0 draw between Scotland and Italy, and then France beat England. 29-7. And some fixtures this weekend from the Premier 15s Cup. Semi-final number one, and sorry, Sports Park Saturday, 2 o'clock, Harlequins take on Worcester, while Exeter take on Bristol at Sandy Park. Same time in that semi-final number two. Fifth six playoff, Alpas Arena Friday at 1 o'clock. Gloucester taking on Saracens. Wasps and Sale Sharks women meet in the 7th eight playoff Twyford Avenue Saturday 2 o'clock Harpers 2 Saturday 9th 10th Loughborough take on DMP Premiership Rugby has announced additional investment in its project rugby programme to improve the diversity of women and girls playing rugby regularly Funding from Asia Sports Foundation and Sport England will enable Premiership Rugby clubs to engage young women from a range of ethnic backgrounds to transition to 200 new female players into local rugby clubs by summer 2022. Bravo. Bravo. So a couple of weeks ago, the varsity game kicked off and it was a 10-all draw, but that means that Oxford retained the trophy from being the winners the year before. Good game of rugby, is that? Um, and enjoyable to, to be at Twickenham. Um, Enjoy the commentary. Did you enjoy your commentary, um, the Six Nations, by the way? I did. I was really nervous, but yeah, no, it was really good fun. Um, yeah, I enjoyed it. I play a little bit of smoke your way, Beth. You're good. Oh, thank you. Really I appreciate good energy. that. Means, that means really, a lot from you. No, really, really good energy. When you come in, you, you lift the, the pace and the tempo, and and clearly passionate and clearly knowledgeable. Um, no, very good. Thoroughly enjoyed it. Thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed it. Thanks, Johnny. That's it. That's it for another week. It's whizzing by, isn't it? We're round four of the Six Nations now. I know. Crazy, crazy, crazy. Um, I hope the people that won the tickets and the shirt are enjoying those in our competition. Uh, That's been great. There are a few interesting chats going on with the WRP surrounding um, World Cup 7s and 15s and what have you. We'll let you know um, all about those as and when we have those. But, yeah, some some exciting times ahead, hopefully, fingers crossed. Um, But it just leaves us to say thank you to Rosie Galligan, uh, to you, Berth, to Tom. um, And just another shout. If there's anyone in this incredible time for women's rugby who would like to come and help us out on the the WRP, uh, it's not a huge amount of, of time each week, but... 
yeah, if you've got some skills, editing, research, that kind of stuff, then then do let us know. Um, we're across all the socials, of course, at Pod Women's Rugby or Women's Rugby Pod at gmail.com. Thank you for listening. Uh, we'll see you.